A bit later, I'll say something about reasons to have children. But one poor reason is to answer objections to one's philosophical position. <laughs> Nevertheless, being now uh, two and a half years into parenting a son and several years before that into uh, working to have one, I feel a little bit better situated than I used to to think about a line of anti-objectivist, anti-individualist reasoning I've often come across. You've heard this before. Ayn Rand was childless, and there are no children in her novels. There are children in the novels, but nonetheless, they're not a focus. There's something that some people react to here. I had a, a distant relative once say, how can you be an individualist? Didn't you have a mother? As though individualism would require us to all just appear in the world, not in relations with other people, not produce other people, and not, again, have sprung forth from them. At a certain level, this is a silly objection. Um, everyone, you know, I'm not the first objectivist to have kids. And <laughs> lots of people have selfish reasons for having them. Indeed, sometimes having children is criticized as selfish. You know, it might, they might pollute uh, or release carbon. But I do, think there, I do think there is a serious question behind or adjacent to these criticisms that kind of motivates them, that makes some of these, these digs that Ayn Rand is childless or not writing about child, children land with some people. And there are two parts to that. The first became clear to me when I was teaching a course on Atlas Shrugged at Chapel Hill when I was teaching there. And we were talking a lot about Rand's view of love in the course. And it's not an obvious fit for parental love. It's about how you love someone because of the virtues of character, what they've made of themselves, who they've become. That's not how you love an infant. They haven't made anything of themselves yet. And yet, love for infants is real. And devotion of parents to children is real. It's an important type of love. It's a model for some people of what love is. God's meant to love us like that think the Christians. Moreover, it's something we devote a lot of our life and time to, human beings in general, to raising children, things to do with raising children. And it's a source of community among people. I had a mother I didn't spring out from nowhere, and it's not just a mother. If you're a leftist, you might think it takes a village to raise a child. If you're a rightist, you might not focus on the village, but on the family. And you might think, since we come from these things, villages, families, we're subordinate to them. We have to take them really seriously, maybe seriously in a way that makes it weird to think of ourselves as individuals, somehow alone in the world, or at least captains of our own destiny. What is the relationship between the kinds of relations, communities involved in bringing up children, which we all once were and which many of us have, and the idea of individualism. The straw man individualist couldn't have or wouldn't want children is, well, a straw man. But why would they exactly? And what role does it play in a life where that life is still individualistic in your hopes for your children, in what you want for yourself as a parent? Also, the objectivist ethics is a biological ethics. It's about our nature as living beings. But one salient fact about living beings Indeed, the most salient fact about them, to a lot of people thinking about them, is that they reproduce, they have offspring. Their lives are organized in part around reproducing. And so you might think, what role does that fact about our biology play in ethics? If it's a fact about biology, about life in general, and we have an ethics based on life, you'd expect it to play some role, maybe the major role. And yet, it's not something that gets talked about in discussions of objectivist ethics. I think there's a reason for that and a reason why it shouldn't have a kind of super centrality to ethics on an objectivist view. But nonetheless, there should be something we can say about it if we want to and we want to think about it. And so I want to think about how this part of life relates to an ethics based on life and based on life as the kind of beings we are. The standard of value for the objectivist ethics is man's life. It's part of life in general that it reproduces. How does reproduction fit into man's life in light of the specific kind of living being a human being is? 
and therefore what role does it play in ethics in light of man's life as the standard of ethics. So that's my topic for today. There's a lot here and I'm just going to kind of touch on a lot of these topics in a kind of drive-by manner. There are three basic sections. The first, facts of life, is on meta-ethical issues, the nature of life, how it relates to egoism, individualism, the objectivist ethics. This will be a little bit technical. The second is on the value of parenting in a rationally selfish life. I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to presume to talk about how to parent because I'm so early in that process and I'm just working it out. But about why we might want to have kids, what the job of being a parent is in a very abstract way, how that kind of commitment might be something someone might want in their lives, why I want it. And third, I'm going to talk a little bit about reproductive and parental rights, the political implications of some of the ethical points that preceded. So section one, the facts of life. Ayn Rand characterized life as a process of self-sustaining and self-generated action. The self in this formulation is, I think, first and foremost, the individual organism involved. It's a certain individual organism, me, a fern plant, a snail, that's generating its actions. And the actions are aimed at sustaining it, sustaining this individual fern plant, this individual snail, etc. Um, I think that's what is meant by self-sustaining first and foremost. But it's not sustaining the individual body of the fern plant or me or the snail just as a lump of matter. What's being sustained is the individual as an organism which is engaged in the process of self-generated, self-sustained ac uh, action. The self that's being sustained is in a way the body, but in a way the process. And it's the entity as a thing engaged in this process, the fern as a fern. The process as a whole is self-sustaining not necessarily in that every element of that process is directed at this fern's continuing to exist in the next moment or hour or year, but in that it does keep the fern in existence, and it's largely a process of just keeping the fern in existence. Even if not every action it takes is one of keeping it in existence, think of how many are and of how this touches every aspect of what goes on in the, in the fern, from the things going on in each cell. If at any moment, at any moment, there's many, many, countless, I'm sure there's some count, but I don't think anyone knows it, countless things going on in the body of a living organism, that if they stop in that moment, the thing would cease to exist, cease to be alive. Acts of cellular metabolism, etc., just keeping it alive minute to minute. And of course, the things it's doing aren't only aimed at the next minute. Some are named at the next month or year, etc. But when we expand the horizon enough, we come up against the important fact that every life is finite. The organism will die. If some of you are enthusiastic about life extension and think you might be able to forestall this indefinitely, uh, we can talk in the Q&A about how that possibility relates to some of what our, I'm saying. But up till now, at least, every organism has died, at least of the types we are. Part of what a life process aims at is perpetuating itself beyond the lifetime of the individual organism. Every species of living thing reproduces, and that's inherent in the nature of life. But not every individual organism aims at reproduction. In some species, certain members reproduce, or at least try to, and others don't often instead supporting the reproduction of others. Think of bees, where there's the queens and the drones and also the workers. And among organisms that reproduce, uh, reproduction plays different roles in the lives of different reproducing animals or plants. Um, it consumes a significant amount of energy in almost all cases, but some are fairly casual. They lay eggs and abandon them and get back to the rest of the business of living and do this over and over again. And others are sort of extravagant. They're the well-known cases of the salmon who swim upstream to spawn and then die, praying mantises who have very rough sex, um, <laughs> octopuses who the mothers um, kind of hang around and basically consume themselves uh, while their, their eggs are hatching. So organisms invest a lot of energy in reproducing, at least many of them do energy that might be thought to keep them alive a little longer. It might seem unselfish, altruistic. 
I want to, I'm mentioning this point in part because I want to think about it in its own right. Why is it worth doing this for some organisms? Is something like this worth it for human beings? But also to differentiate what I think the objectivist position is from a line of reasoning that I don't think is any part of objectivism, but which I've encountered very often in criticisms of objectivism, including by people who have engaged in it thoughtfully and sympathetically, and that I infer a lot of objectivists must sort of tacitly hold or, or, or not have clearly differentiated in their mind from, uh, from what I think is the actual uh, position. So put straight, the view that I think is a mistake is that ethical egoism is a matter of emulating other organisms' supposed single-track focus on their individual survival. Other organisms do this. Everything they do is to keep themselves alive. We should do it too. Uh, informally, I call this the Cole Porter argument. You know, birds do it, bees do it. Even educated fleas do it. Let's prioritize our own survival. But to state it this way is to expose the problem because what Porter tells us that the English souls get up to in shallow shoals isn't prioritizing their survival, but falling in love, and specifically mating. And this idea that there's something in the mating, the falling in love impulse, which is part of nature, and that draws us away from self-interest, is an old idea in the history of philosophy. Um, you can find versions of it in ancient philosophy. Auguste Comte, the coiner of altruism, sees in the mating instinct the beginning of the other regardingness that can come to full flower in human beings who are capable of fully living for others. I'll get back to Comte later. If this isn't why we should be egoists, because other animals are, since it doesn't seem they always are, or are they, well, what is? Here's how I think about it. Egoism follows not from the mere fact that we're all alive and that all living things seek to sustain themselves, although they do. It follows from what's distinctive to human beings. We have reason and free will, which makes us individuals. The life process of a human being, we'll put it this way, the life process of a coral bush or an ant in an ant colony or a fern, it's hard to say, is it carrying it out as a member of the colony, as an individual, is it the whole colony that's doing it? But human beings, it's not ambiguous in that same way. Because we think and we have free will. That's the locus of our choices and our selections and our values. For other animals, how they live is selected for them species-wide by nature. There's either one way that all the animals of that species live, or all the plants, or there are a few functional roles they fall into that are themselves defined by the nature of the species, male and female, for example, or alpha and beta, or worker and queen, or whatever it is, but just a handful. Everywhere you find this animal, they're all living that way, or all the ones of this sort are living that way. And we specify a way of life for an animal species or for a functional type, male, female, alpha, beta, worker, drone, etc., within that species by describing things like what it eats, how it gets it, by what procedures it mates, the specific things, it does this dance and they get the pollen, you know, kind of writing a little biography of it. Not so for human beings. At the highest level of abstraction, there's one way for human beings to live, namely rationally which is the way specified by the principles of the objectivist ethics. But living rationally is compatible with an inexhaustibly vast range of ways of living described more concretely. We don't have to do a certain dance and get our food that way, or we don't have to farm, or we don't have to hunt or gather or whatever. There are many, many different ways to do it, right? An inexhaustibly vast range of possible ways to satisfy our nutritional needs, to reproduce, with new ways always being discovered to satisfy our basic needs. Likewise, the task of managing human reproduction and making use of the organs that evolve to subserve human reproduction. Not only is the human way of life compatible with a vast range of concrete ways of satisfying our needs and using our faculties, essential to the human way of life is creativity in such matters. A human being's life, his process of self-sustaining and self-generated action, is not an algorithm inherited from previous generations. It's a new distinctive life he has forged for himself, created for himself, in response to the general facts that give rise to human life, such as that we have certain needs and capacities as a species, and in response to all the specific individuating features of his own nature and circumstances. An analogy. Birds sing species-specific songs, which they use to attract mates. Human beings compose songs and symphonies to be played on instruments they create, 
and used for purposes that are not limited to attracting lovers, which lovers are not limited to helping them raise a brood. An individual's life, like an individual composer's song, is a new integration. It's something that he comes up with, drawing on the relevant facts of nature, including his needs and abilities, both the needs and abilities that he shares with other human beings and those that differentiate him from them. It's a specific life, a product of his mind and choices. And this specific life is the individual's ultimate value upon which his other values depend. It's the individuality of the whole process of value formation, including the formation of a life, that's the essence of egoism. Egoism goes through the mind and free will. Other animals just enact an algorithm with fixed inputs, fixed ways of performing, and it doesn't really matter how they relate to the others in their species. They do it how the algorithm says. Human beings form values, come up with ways of acting by the mind, come up with ways to satisfy human needs using human abilities through our mind, and that's a process each of us can only do for himself. So each of us can only have values for himself. Values as such are inherently individualistic. They're someone's values, someone who's thought about them. What does it take then for something to be a value that is to be a value individualistically? There's a context of needs and abilities, things like human beings need to eat. That's one of the basic facts behind all our values in one way or another, that our life depends on getting food, that we have certain abilities, chiefly reason, but also the more concrete ones. Um, you know, we have hands and such. We can only move things in certain ways. Part of a wide context that forms the context for our values. Then for something to be a value egoistically, you need an idea for an end, achievable via the abilities you have, that could be made to serve some need. That end could be your need to serve need. Then the achievement and pursuit of that end can be integrated without contradiction into a life of pursuing other such ends, such that the whole amounts to a self-sustaining process that is a life. The life as a whole and the specific ends within it are chosen by individuals in light of some sort of recognition of these facts, that we have needs, that we have ways of fulfilling them, that it's up for us to choose them, that they have to fit together into a consistent whole. That's what's involved in rationally, egoistically valuing something. And the we here is each of us as an individual doing this. So how are children of value in this way? Why might they be of value to you? Well, using this model, we have to have needs and abilities by which they be, can be created and raised. I think the abilities in the broadest outline are clear. Um, the abilities just to produce them, but also the physical and intellectual work involved in raising them. But why is it a value to do this for an individual? What needs of the individual does it serve? And how does it fit into an individual's life? Or can it fit into an individual's life? The needs that it serves are obvious at a species level. But why should they matter to any individual? Obviously, the major personal reasons why some of us have had children or plan to have children are spiritual. There's something about what life means to us, what we want to get out of it. But I want to start with some of the material facts, the facts about material needs that form the context for such spiritual values. Each of us needs there to be a next generation to help him to satisfy even the most basic material needs across the whole of his lifespan. Think of a peasant on a farm. Peasants on farms trying to be as self-supporting as they can need kids. Who's going to harvest the crops when they get older? Even if they're not thinking about posterity or something, but just about their own lifespan, work's going to need to get done when they get older. And there was a um, Particularly, they need sons. There was a whole issue in China when they had the one-child policy of um, Chinese farmers really wanting sons and, and um, uh, killing infant girls for that reason. Um, but in general, think of the issue of who will care for one when one is elderly. There need to be younger people. I hasten to add that I think, as Rand did, that it's really wrong for a parent to have children in order to be his servants when he's older. We're not breeding slaves here. And I think it's wrong for children to think they're under any moral obligation to assist parents in, in old age. Um, but 
the fact that many people have lived in this kind of way, having children to help them when they're older, expecting that of the children, feeling obligated to do it, underscores the fact that the old have material need for the young, a fact that was handled poorly, as most facts have been, in primitive societies. How do we handle it now? Well, we tax everyone to help raise the young and then to give a lot of money to people in their old age, right? That's how it works these days. And a lot of people have thought of that as undermining the family structure, but as good, if you're on the left, people tend to think of it as good because it gives people more independence from their traditional families. People on the right sometimes worry about it for that reason. That's also through a collectivism, not a right way to handle it. What is the right way to handle the fact that the old need the young? Well, the proper human way for someone to plan to meet his material needs for useful assistance in his twilight years is neither to breed service nor to collectivize the process as we do now by taxing everyone to homogeneously, edu homogeneously educate the young and subsidize the elderly. It's simply for people to save money during their prime to hire assistance in old age. But it requires that there be a next generation to do that. The material value of there being a next generation to someone living in a human society is is great, and it's in a lot of places that might not be immediately obvious. For example, if you're saving money, not only do you need the people to hire with the money when you're younger, but the value of the money depends on there being a productive economy in which you can trade it. Even gold, right, doesn't, isn't valuable in its own right if there's no one making anything to trade for it. And then think of the specific activities in which your own life, even if you're only concerned about your own life during your own lifespan, consists, right? Your work, your hobbies, everything you do like that. None of these can be what they are, except on the supposition of human life carrying on forward after you. Your job wouldn't be the same job if it was expected that when you were 65 or 85, the whole race would drop dead, right? We wouldn't need to build things the ways that you build them. We, our needs would be very different. So there's a material need built into so much about the way we live, a supposition that the, you know, people will carry on living, that there'll be a next generation, and that next generation is of value. There's also a spiritual need for it. I don't think it's possible to value anything, at least anything abstract, only for the present. The embeddedness of the things one values in continuing human life is part of what I think even psychologically makes it capable to value them. There's this spiritual aesthetic component to this, but I think it's grounded just in the practical necessity that whatever one's making and building a life of bomb making, if that thing is of fleeting value, a value only for five years, 10 years, 20 years to anyone, that is, there's no one to value it after that, then it's not gonna be of as much value now to anyone as it will be if it can go on having use after you. And you can then capitalize on that future value of it. All of your specific values depend in different ways on your living in a society and in a society that existed before you and will continue after you. But I want to differentiate that idea from saying that you're organically part of some larger whole in anything like the way a cell or an organism is, uh, sorry, a cell or an uh, organ is part of an animal, that is from the collectivist view. Let me quote Comte again as an archetype of this collectivist view and differentiate what I'm saying from him. He says, no being can nobly labor for itself save humanity. Her servants for the time being do but employ in the interests of her servants yet unborn the products which they get from the materials collected by her servants in the past. There's humanity, that's the thing that's living. We are her servants in the present, and all we do is, in the interests of her, the next generation, uh, use the materials gathered by past generations. Here's my replacement for that. Here's what I think the individualist perspective on that. The only nobility lies in the individual who lives for himself. And he does this by trade to mutual advantage by mutual consent with other individuals, including, importantly, those individuals of preceding and seceding generations. There's no non-individualism in wanting to be around other people indeed needing to be around other people to live fully and one's best, to live in exchange from them. And that's true when one's talking not just about individuals of one's own generation, but being part of a succession of generations. 
Very well. These are reasons why it should be of personal value to each of us that human life go on after us, that there is a next generation. But why not leave it to others to make that next generation? What's the reason to have kids oneself? And how does having them fit into a life one can choose for oneself? What's the role of parenting in a life? It's a particularly pressing and interesting question because the thing most, the two things most like parenting in one's life are career and other relationships. And it's importantly different from each of them, although there are common values to be found. What is a career? Well, it's a central activity of creating material values that sustain life. This is how one create, sustains one's own life materially through trade. It forms the central organizing activity of one's life, according to objectivism. And it's a source of material value, a spiritual value, such as self-esteem. Also, you often make friends and form relationships through your work. Parenting is like career in that it's time consuming. It's over decades. And it necessarily has a structuring influence on your life. You can't have kids and it just, you can have a hobby that's a pretty minor hobby. You can't be a parent and it's like, you know, a pretty minor thing that you do, or at least you can't do it well. Moreover, it necessarily, I don't want to say quite vies with career for central purpose, but there's a lot of questions about how do you balance parenting and career. But I don't think it can take the place of career for two reasons. First, it's non-renumerative, right? You don't make money parenting. You can hire yourself out as a nanny, surrogate of various kinds, teacher, and those are good things to do, but then you're not parenting. There's some, it's not your kid, right? There's some division of labor within a family also, and a family could specialize with one parent staying home with the kids and the other going out and making work outside the home. But some parenting is non-alienable. Teaching and nursing are not parenting. And if you're doing it for the money, what you're doing is in parenting. Moreover, being a parent can only be a full-time occupation when the children are young. It doesn't take up one's whole life or as much of one's life as a career can. Both of these points, I think, are the, the analogy to career and the disanalogy are made by Ayn Rand. In Atlas Shrugged, there's the famous scene in the valley where there's the young mother who also runs a bake shop, and uh, she talks about parenting as her career. Um, and that stresses, I think, the kind of thought and attention she gives to it, how serious and important a part of her life it is. Um, and so it's like career for her, and uh, presumably she spends more time with the kids than does her husband, and there's a kind of division of labor there, and that's talked about. But later in the Playboy interview, uh, Rand is asked, can parenting be a career for a mother? Do women need careers too? And she says, yes, they need careers other than parenting. Uh, and part of the reason is that you can only be a full-time parent for a certain period of time. It's not going to be a career that, um, that lasts your life. And if it does, it's going to be like you're going to take things from it that you're going to use in other areas. You're going to learn a lot about education while you have a kid and you're going to uh, then go into education or about time management or something else. Um, okay, so it's not playing the role of career because it's not remunerative in the way that career is, and that's part of what's central to career. And it can't be fully an organizing principle for a life in the way career is, although it can play a significant role in organizing it. What role then does it play, and how can it be selfish for it to play it? Well, I think the obvious answer is the one that I gave before, that it is a tremendous spiritual value, and that's how everybody experiences it. It's in the same realm as art and relationships. But it's a very distinctive kind of relationship one has and wants to have with a child. According to objectivism, personal relationships are trades, spiritual analogs of material trades. They're by mutual consent to mutual advantage, as trades are. And what each seeks from the relationship is a kind of spiritual pleasure in the other person's character, in his virtues, in what he made of himself. The reaction one grants him, one's love, esteem, admiration, etc., is in response to what he's made of himself. But none of this applies to infants, and it only applies partially to older children. The parents choose to have a kid, there's the choice element, at least in free countries, but the child doesn't have any choice in the matter. And the parents don't choose which kid to have from among, I guess if you go to an orphanage maybe, but from among some list of possibilities, right? Um, 
nor is love for the child from infancy based on anything the infant has made of himself, since he's made nothing of himself yet. What is it that we value in an infant? And by we here, I mean not just the infant's parents, but everyone, because every decent person thinks there's something valuable about babies. Like them, people, you know, have a smile on their face, they want them to do well. You'd have to have a pretty lousy person to have ill will towards an infant. Why? What is it? Well, what we value, I think, is humanity as such, the human potential. It's something that we all love as part of loving ourselves to the extent that we do love ourselves. Love for the kind of thing we are. Love for humanity is self-love in the abstract. Not just love for what you in particular have made of yourself, but love for oneself as the sort of thing one is that can make this sort of thing of oneself and can make so many other wonderful things as well. To become a parent is to focus intently on a particular instance of that potential and to commit to helping it to realize itself. It's to go deep on humanity in the being of a particular new human. Typically, though not always, one does this with a child who's biologically one's own, biologically related to one, and so whose innate endowments are likely to resemble one's own and one's chosen partners, and that could add an extra element of familiarity or of closeness to self-love, but that is love of oneself in particular as opposed to humanity in general and uh, as the species to which one belongs. And all parents, no doubt, have hopes about some specific traits of theirs or the people they love that they'd like to see in their offspring. But part of what's exciting and scary about parenting is that you don't ju know just who the child will be, not before he's born and not while he's young. And in committing to raise him, you're devoting yourself to his person in particular, but to a person about whom you know nothing, a stranger, to humanity in general in the person of this developing person, and to forming, uh, forming and deepening a relationship with him as he becomes who will be, who will be. I want to read something I wrote about this in, the, in a companion to Ayn Rand, now available in paperback in the bookstore here. Um, years ago, during a time when my wife and I were trying to have a kid, but not yet successful. This generic love of the human potential and its exercise and development is surely only part of the root of a parent's love for his child. If the child is his own biologically and the result of a loving relationship, the parent will soon identify in this generic potential countless small individuating features that he values in himself and his lover. And whether or not the child is biologically his own, as she grows, he will also observe in the child many learned characteristics he, and if applicable, his partner, have passed on. Moreover, because of the closeness of the parent-child relationship, he will have a unique and potentially joyous perspective on the child's development of her own distinctive character and on the specific role in this developing character of the values he cherishes in himself and his partner. That's very much how I was thinking about it or part of how I was thinking about it in my own case and I think assuming how other parents think about it while we were trying to have a kid. I want to add a few other personal observations about what I see as the value. Some of them I think I knew at the time, others have become clearer to me since. Parenting helps to keep one's perspective metaphysical on what matters in life and what matters for human beings. You have lots of hopes and worries and plans for your children, but particularly as they're young, and even when they're older, I think you're seeing them as people who had been young and who have come up with you. You have to think about that in the trajectory of a human life. Does this particular thing so matter as much as the abstraction under which it falls? Does it matter if he gets this job or that job that he wants or that I hope for him or does well in this or that task or does it matter that he develops his ability, that he develops his character traits? It helps you focus on what's important and what matters. It helps you focus on your own values and why they're important and what about what's important to them is distinctive to you and what are the general parts of it? And how much of each of those you want to share and why? Another value of parenting that I think is important in this spiritual realm, it keeps growth and development central to your life. This is a big part of why I wanted a child. I think about when I was younger, there was always some next thing, some next stage of growth. You, you get from this grade to that grade to that grade and so forth. 
um, and you always have your eye on the next milestone, the next thing that's going to happen. When you're established in a career and working, you have milestones, things you're reaching towards, but it's not as quick, not as even, not as much a part of your life that there's a progression. Uh, it's easy to stagnate, but even if you don't stagnate, even if you're growing, you don't see that growth in that regular way. But when there's a child, the passage of time is marked by noticeable, clear growth and development. And you have to grow and develop in dealing with the child. So it's a way to keep human growth, development, expansion of life as a kind of perceptually available, clear part of your day-to-day -day life. And I, I, that was important to me. I've given sort of general reasons that I think most or every parent uh, can have to want a child, but I think it's also important to integrate the value of parenting to you if you are one, and it's a part of what we're doing as parents, to your specific other values in ways specific to you and as your children develop to them. So for me, for example, I am in part an epistemologist, and I'm very interested in seeing how knowledge develops. Uh, and there are all kinds of anecdotes of that that I'm particularly attending to in my young son's life, seeing the hierarchy of concepts develop. Other parents with other interests might focus somewhat differently. And to bring the kids' interest in, the particular development of the hierarchy of concepts that I've been thinking about a lot recently has to do with motor vehicle concepts, which aren't of any particular interest to me, but are of a great deal to him. There are lots of examples of kind of epistemological insights from uh, being with kids and mine from being with mine that I'm happy to talk about, but I'll leave them to the Q&A if people are interested in, in that. Okay, so I've talked about why it's a value to have a next generation, how that value relates to human life in general, and why a particular parent might want, why a particular person might want to be a parent, what the spiritual value of devoting a lot of one's time and energy to this can be. I want to talk now about some political implications of this. I want to talk now about rights. The key context for talking about rights with parents and children is that human beings develop. We develop out of other human beings who must scaffold our early life process at the very beginning, literally internally, as the mother scaffolds the developing child, and then externally, but through support, development, training, having them live with us and enjoy our lives with us. And the parents must devote much of their lives to this process of scaffolding the new developing life, of raising the kids. Parenting is serious business, first of all, and not something that should or morally could be forced on anyone. Abortion and birth control are rights, important parts of the right to liberty. There are, in essence, two arguments that have ever been given against the legality of abortion. One argument, a recent one in the history of thought on this subject is that abortion is essentially murder because the fetus or unburbed child, as some are want to term it, is a human being with rights. The other argument, more common historically, is a general argument against birth control. Our sexual faculty exists for reproduction, and it's wrong, selfish, irresponsible to attempt to use it for pleasure while taking steps to avoid the possible burden of parenthood. This is the position of the Catholic Church. But it's, in general, I think, a position that's held, and abortion is held as an instance of this. It's just a type of child of birth control. With regard to the second of these arguments, the anti-birth control argument, all of our faculties, all human faculties, whatever their evolutionary origins, are here for us to make what we can of them under the direction of our mind for the service of our own lives and happiness. That's what it means to be human. The human way of life is the way of life directed by reason. It's the way of life that takes all the material offered to us by nature and shapes it to something in service of the life that we choose for ourselves. In biology, it happens all the time that things initially evolved for one purpose 
are then repurposed for another. Wings started as something that would help birds cool themselves and then got repurposed to help them fly. Sexual organs, likewise, can be repurposed. Let me read you something about Francisco and Daphne. He taught her every manner of sensuality he could invent. Isn't it wonderful that our bodies can give us so much pleasure? He said to her once, quite simply. They were happy and radiantly innocent. They were both incapable of the conception that joy is a sin. That's the human form of sexuality. Of course, one of the ways sex organs can bring joy is in bundles of joy for those who want them. <laughs> but that's just one. What about the other issue? Is abortion murder? A fetus isn't the sort of being that can have rights. Suppose here that a normal human being were somehow put in the position of the fetus. This is an adult. It's not someone who nearly needs continual care as someone in a coma might, which care might be provided by different people who are competent to it. It's someone who's become attached somehow to one specific person in a manner so as to constantly draw on her body in the most intimate way, such that every one of his actions was an imposition on her, occupying her body, expanding it, making her vomit, kicking her from the inside, blaming, draining her blood for nutrients, exposing her to the risks of preeclampsia, and so on ad nauseum, nauseum in particular. <laughs> to think that a person, any person, even a fully grown person with rights, could have a right to this sort of support from somebody, and that the person in this position would have no right to remove him, is to say that she has no right, no right to her life, no right to her liberty, no right to her body. Even if someone could somehow contract to get into this position, I don't think it could be an enforceable contract. But an adult who, in this fanciful example, and by the way, it's a, uh, there's a famous example by... Um, Judith Jarvis Thompson, a philosopher, about someone who wakes up finding herself hooked to a violinist who's living in life support on her body, that this is a variant of. But an, an adult who finds himself in this condition is the sort of being that has rights. But in this condition, he can have no right to expect his host to keep him alive. It would be justifiable for her. Maybe it would be nice of her to keep him on. Maybe she even should do it, but he has no right to demand it, and she has every right to live her life free of him. That's what a right to life is, hers. Now a fetus at any stage of pregnancy isn't just some guy who found himself hooked up to someone. It's a type of being that by its nature is in this condition, that only comes to be or can come to be in this condition, and that cannot transition to being in any other condition except by further extraordinary uses of the woman's body. This is not the kind of being that can have rights, any rights of any kind at all. This is an essential difference between types of beings. There's not some magic moment when the human life begins and we're endowed with humanity and rights or personhood. Human beings develop along a long process in which we pass from potentially human beings to actual human beings. It starts before conception. After all, there's the genetic potentials of the sperm and egg. There's the mathematical combination of this sperm with that egg before it actually happens. There are all the unconceived that the Christians haven't thought to be worried about yet, but they're people too, by the same logic as that the unborn are. They, there's the fertilization, there's the beginning of the splitting, you form a blastocyst, it implants at some point, and there's a long process in which various different of the potentialities become actualized, uh, passing through birth, now you have a new individuated separate from the woman being, but it still can't go on and live on its own. It has to keep on growing and keep on being supported by the parents or by someone um, until it's an adult. We develop slowly over time, from conception and before through birth and beyond. What rights are are principles about the sphere in which individuals can unilaterally decide things. And human beings have them because of the needs of mature, functional adults in a social context interacting with one another. There are reasons, important reasons, which we can discuss in the Q&A if you want, 
Why rights apply in derivative ways to other human beings and mature functional adults? Why they apply to children, to mentally handicapped people, to people in comas, and so forth and so on. But they can't be extended indefinitely. And a sin qua non for having rights is being born, being physiologically independent and separate from any other human being. And if you're concerned about conjoined twins in this instance, you can ask. So the first issue with rights in children is that we have to have the right to have them or not. The right to decide whether to be parents. The right to control our own reproduction. For parenthood to be planned. The human way to function with sex is to think about it and plan it. And you have a moral responsibility, in my view, if you're having sex and don't and aren't prepared the responsibility of childhood, to have decided already, if you're a woman, whether you'll have an abortion and that you'll have one or else you shouldn't be doing it, and if you're a man that you don't want to be with a woman who you're not confident will make that choice. But I want to move on to the subject. I spent a little bit more time on this one than I had planned to when I first proposed the talk because of what's happening politically in the country right now because of Roe having been overturned. And I expect there'll be more questions about this issue for that reason. But I want to turn to parental responsibility and children's rights. Children are born dependent. They're put in this position of dependency by parents who've created them and who thereby have a responsibility to raise them. The primarily legally relevant relation of parents to children is one of an obligation. But it's a sui generis relationship of obligation that arises from our nature as a species that we arise in this way, out of one another, and dependent. And a prospective parent's rights to liberty and to the pursuit of happiness imply not only that they have a right to decide whether or not to have children, but they need a large scope of freedom to decide how to integrate children in their lives, how to raise them. If you're going to have children, it's a huge part of your life. It's part of what you take into account when you make the decision to have them. And that's a part of your life that you need to be able to choose knowing what your responsibilities will be, knowing what scope you'll have in exercising them. And I don't think you can choose it responsibly unless you know that you'll have a significant scope in exercising them, in fostering the development of human potential in light of your views of what human beings are, of what's good for them, of what the right way of life is of what matters and what doesn't. This means parents, in order to responsibly become parents, need a great deal of freedom over how to raise the child. And they need any constraints on this freedom to be as clear as possible from the outset and in informing their choice. It cannot be and is not the responsibility of the state to ensure that children are raised well or treated well by anyone's judgment other than the parents, and particularly raised well. It's part of a parent's right to raise a child badly. For example, religiously, whether in traditional religion or some woke or environmentalist variation on it. And these kinds of things are much more damaging to children than a lot of forms of what might be physical abuse, I think. But it's part of the fact that we live by our minds, including raising children by our minds, that we have to have freedom that includes this scope to make these kinds of mistakes. These freedoms are necessary to ensure the right to raise children well in a world where our neighbors might not agree with us on what raising children well amounts to. A particularly important right here is educational freedom. Our children are raised collectivistically I was told once of a law in Israel. I don't think it was in effect. I think it was being proposed. It was at a conference. I was being told this by someone who supported this law, whereby they would try to prevent parents from reading to their children more than did other parents. Because it's unequal. You read a lot to him, I think, right, to your son, and someone else didn't, and he's doing pretty well. And um, for people on the tape, I'm pointing to a family I could see in the front row. Um, you get a poor start in life. Social resources aren't being fairly distributed. And the first thing I thought when I heard that is if I lived in a society with that kind of law, I wouldn't have a kid. 
How could you morally do it? It's disgusting and despicable. We don't have that, thankfully, here. I don't even think they have it there. But that someone could even propose such a thing. But we have so much of that in many We have our money is all taken to raise everyone's kids collectively in schools. The premise behind that is already given away. And it's crucially important to fight against it. Educational freedom is a major human rights issue. It's a major individual rights issue. The kinds of things that you can do wrong with a child by raising him poorly, though, by raising him in a way that you have every freedom to do, are often much more damaging than many of the things that are plausibly child abuse, corporal punishment, refusing children's vaccinations and other medical treatments in all but the most dire circumstances. These things, I think, too, must often be within the rights of parents. Standards for child abuse and state action to interfere with parenting must be very high and very near to the conceptual level, involving some type of battery that can't rationally, if misguidedly, be aimed at discipline, things like deprival of needed food or of medical treatment in direct emergencies. They have to be very high. And there are a lot of things today that are thought by various parties to be child abuse and should be banned by law that I don't think can be. Think about conversion therapy for gay people. That is where you go to, they, they go to a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist tries to convince them to be straight or does whatever they do. Unless this involves physical torture, I think it's got to be okay for a parent to send a kid to it. Wrong, bad, mistaken, I think, based on my understanding of psychology, but within their rights if the child's young enough. I'll get to that in a moment. Likewise, I think gender-affirming care for trans teens, which is now illegal according to the administration in Texas. That is, care that confirms saying that, telling them that they are the gender that they think they are, affirming that, um, and in some cases administering hormones. My point here isn't that this care is good or appropriate. I have no idea whether it is, and I suspect no one knows for sure whether it is. But it's not something the Texas voters or their henchmen in the state house, I think, are qualified to decide, or have any right to decide. The two parties here are the parents and the child. As the child is growing, I think more and more of these decisions, especially in certain realms, have to come up to the child. Children can get emancipated already by law. I think that's important. In some areas of law, I think they should be treated as quasi-emancipated as early as possible, that not everything should go through the parents. But if decisions have to be made and they can't be made by the child himself, he's not responsible enough to make them, then I think it has to be up to the parents except in very clear cases of abuse. It's a tremendously difficult area of law. The one in which I find it most difficult is pregnancy. What if someone underage gets pregnant? It happens too often. I think for someone under the age of 18, but still old enough to plausibly make her own decisions, she needs to be treated as an adult for the purposes of those decisions, including if that means keeping things from her parents or going against their wishes. But a nine-year-old can get pregnant, a 10-year-old. Where's the dividing line? What's the role of courts here? It's a tremendously difficult area of law. I don't have all the answers. I think you'd have to really read about the case law and think about what's done. Difficult topic. I want to close on a more pleasant topic. By recalling why this area of law is difficult. Why is this hard? Why are there these difficult questions here? Human beings are living things. And life is a process of action. We develop from other organisms of our species via a process of individuation in which at first our lives have to be scaffolded and directed by parents who are doing this as a major component of their own lives. This scaffolding is at first physiological and then takes various social forms as it does with many other animal species. What distinguishes us is that we are the rational animal the ones who, as we develop, are conceiving, choosing, and starting to achieve values that will add up to a self-sustaining whole, 
to a life of our own, a life that we love, and in the context, and that in the context of which we can love other specific values that can have deep personal meaning for us, the life of individuals. And when we choose to have children ourselves, it can and should be as chosen parts of such a life. All the ethical and legal questions are about how one implements that point. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, great talk, actually. I've been thinking about this topic a lot, that uh, Ayn Rand characterized life as a process of self-sustaining, self-generated action, whereas well, just about any biologist or any biology textbook says life is very much a process of self-generated, self-sustaining action and reproduction. Mm -hmm. And since the objectivist ethics is based on the facts of what life is, uh, do you think um, that uh, reintegrating reproduction into the general concept of life would make a big, a big uh, impact on the objectivist ethics and things like other, uh, other virtues that might be needed for that, specifically the human form of reproduction, such as compromise with one's partner, um, conflict resolution, even like having a good relationship with your parents who you might be completely against your values because things like grandparenting are valuable. Yeah. Well, first, I don't think that uh, phrase, um, process of self-generated and uh, self-sustaining action is a definition or was intended by Rand as such. Uh, Harry Binswanger uh, has told me that he insisted to her that it wasn't when he quoted it as a definition once. Um, and I, I take that seriously, and I think it's not quite a definition. Um, as for what you find in biology textbooks, it's a little bit more, they tend to describe a lot of features of life and then try to order them or connect them together. This starts with Aristotle, who gives a kind of list of the things, living things do, and then talks about the hierarchy between them. And I think as early as Aristotle, I think it's the right way of doing it, the right way to think about reproduction is extending one's life process beyond oneself so that um, the right way to think about reproduction and its role in life is in you have a process that goes on a lifespan and then part of it is passing it on or playing some role in passing it on, at least for most organisms in most species. Uh, some people, particularly um, Dawkins and some others, think about reproduction's role in life uh, differently um, and that's a kind of philosophy of biology question. As to the ethical question, that's what this talk was meant to answer. If you focus on this aspect of life, on reproduction, what ethical difference does it make? Uh, what are the ethical implications of it? Particularly when you think of us not just as animals, but as rational animals, the kind of animals we are. Not just as living things, but as things that are like and unlike other living things in the way that we are. And the way that we are different from other living things is that we live by reason. Reason directs and sets the course of our lives, and everything that's of value to us is only of value through that. And I think when you do that, when you think about human beings that way, the level of abstraction that's involved when you think about human lives and projects and values shoots way up. The things that are virtues are not concerned only with some major or large area of life, but with the structure and organization of a life as a whole, as it applies to any human being, whatever his goals and projects are, and some don't choose to be parents. And I don't think there's any reason why everybody has to choose to be parents. Um, there's no biological reason. On other species, not everyone you know, is a parent or even tries to be a parent, and it's up to us to figure out what life we want for ourselves. If you're living in a way that would preclude there being future generations or shows ill will or malice towards it, you're clearly doing something wrong and unpleasant and unviable. But if you're just not being a parent, not wanting to be one, that's, uh, that's no problem. So I don't think there are special moral virtues involved with reproduction. I think you just have to think about what the moral virtues that guide us in general uh, say about that. Now, working together, teamwork, conflict resolution, 
Whether those are moral virtues or not, I think they're a little bit too concrete to count as moral virtues. They're good things to have and get good at in life that apply in many areas of life. Child rearing is not the only cooperative endeavor that we have great reason to engage in, right? And uh, it's, a, it's a particularly important one, but not the only one. And so I'm all for thinking about how to work well with people, but I don't think that's a kind of change in ethics that comes when you think about reproduction. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Um, I have a question. Um, uh, I think uh, you mentioned in your talk uh, that it's, there's, rational, there's benefit to all members of society, or at least I think most productive people, to having a next generation um, and to uh, also having just a larger population, you know, more division of labor. Um, I consider that for myself, I think, something, whether or not I'm interested in having children at some point, something that I think is a value of, to me, even if I choose to have a career that, um, you know, and not have children. Um, but I was wondering, right now we have a lot of socialization of, uh, so socialized methods of incentivizing people to have children. Like we have public education, there's even child tax credits and things like that. Um, and, um, and another point that I'll just bring up is that uh, I'm, I'm not sure why people have fewer children, but I know that, or why people choose to have the number of children they do, but I know that having a child is very expensive. Um, and sometimes that is a factor, a reason why people might not have a lot of children. So I'm wondering if we lived in a rights land, so to speak, where we didn't have this socialized, you know, um, government forced uh, incentivization of having children, do you think that it would be rational for individuals, particularly individuals who maybe do focus on a career and choose not to have children, to, uh, to f like help incentivize others to have children and, and possibly contribute to charities for families or, or uh, contribute to scholarships for K through 12 education. Like if we're looking at a system where we don't have these things forced, do you think that there's, there would be rational reason for members of society who, who choose to have a career and choose not to have children to contribute um, because of the rational benefit that they're getting as individuals from others having children and, and increasing the population or continuing the population? Yeah, I think that already happens and has always happened and by necessity has to happen. Uh, I'll say a bit about why, but let me back up. I, that it's important that there be a next generation for everyone doesn't mean that it's important it be of a particular size or that anybody knows what size it should be or that there's any central planner or philanthropist who could say, you know, the best population for the next generation should be that we want a baby boom or we want a smaller next population or whatever like they can say exactly how much the electrical grid should get from this or that source. That's just central planning. It's not a kind of thing that I think anybody can do. People learn how to adapt to these kind of things and have kids or not. And there's no one I think who should be working on setting the incentive structures for the next generation. Central planning I don't think is, is right for economies and it's not right for, for families. That's the kind of thing that's up to individuals and will emerge out of individuals making the decisions that they make. And the right next generation size is the size that the people of this generation decide to have it. But you can't take it with you. And it's foolish to try to spend down to your last dollar before you die. I mean, you don't know when you're going to die and you don't want to like, you know, here's the last meal and if I got to zero, I've, I've won life, right? Um, if you're living well, you, you, you will, um, at least you will have some reserves when you die and something's got to happen to them. And I think uh, most of the things that most people do with them are with a mind to what's going to happen after them, especially to the young. And I think in a society where there are a lot of needs for charity for the young, that's, um, uh, or not even charity, just kind of support for institutions for the young, that's the kind of thing that's always been attractive to philanthropists and with good reason, endowing libraries and so forth and um, you know, schools and whatever. I think that's where a lot of capital would go from, um, retire, from passing away people without children and from people who don't want to leave their children billions of dollars in legacy because they don't think they know how to handle it. And I think that's that aspect, the, the altruistic, no one should have this much money aspect of the giving pledge I think is ridiculous. But I think also it's kind of weird to give if you've made a billion dollars your son who didn't a billion dollars unless you've really done a lot to ramp him up to knowing what to do with that much money. It's going to be a bigger problem in his life than an asset. And if you have billions of dollars, you know, you got to figure out what you want to do with it. 
Um, could you say something about the possibility of life extension and how that impacts on the material need for a future generation, as well as what you just commented on just now? Yeah, I mean, so if you don't think you're going to die, you think you're going to continue on forever, <laughs> or at least your generation largely is, um, or at least you won't die of old age, well, some people are going to get hit by trucks or whatever. So there's going to be some attrition, maybe how many new people we need, uh, it's a little less pressing. But um, I think there are reasons to value the young and a next generation coming after you in a field, even if you don't think you're going anywhere. There are new perspectives young people bring to things, um, new developments they lead to, not just because the old are atrophying. So a kind of significant experience in my life that I've had the real pleasure to repeat from the other side of it was uh, when I got to know Harry Binswanger. I had been listening, I don't know if Harry's here, uh, I'd been listening to uh, a lot of his courses uh, before that, and I really kind of was deep in, in Harry's particular way of presenting some points of objectivism before I got to know him personally. And then when we had conversations, started having conversations, it became clear that certain things that he had, formulations that he had worked out or perspectives of his, I had sort of internalized were more automatized for me than for him. He was sort of working up to them and I was just taking them for granted. Now there's a way in which that can be bad in which you, um, you know, people think we learned all this stuff from my man, we have to remake it and figure out how she saw it firsthand. But there's also a way in which it can be good and helpful. And I like pointed out some things to him and he said, yeah, that's, that's true and good and whatever and that he wouldn't have seen himself. And I thought, wow, this is cool that I can do this, that I've kind of grown up on what he provided. And I've gotten to know some people who learned those same kind of issues in objectivist epistemology after some of my courses where I kind of presented some of my versions of conceptualizing them, which were based on things I'd learned from Leonard and Harry and Alan Gotthalf and others, as well as what I'd learned directly from my Rand, uh, from her books, that is, um, and who had a kind of automatization of points that I had worked up to and got them very early in their development. And they had a different kind of fresh perspective on it. Um, I think of Matt Bateman in particular uh, in this connection which I found really helpful and illuminating. There's a, a value to learning things at different points in your learning curve and to deal with people who've internalized certain things early. There's a kind of diversity of perspectives across generations where um, there's a value to having worked your way up to certain perspectives and a value to learning them early and having them kind of automatized in your hierarchy in a way that comes, I think, not just with time but with them being there at the beginning. Um, and so I think there's that kind of diversity of opinion is valuable. I think also just if we're at the point where we can live forever, we're going to be expanding across the galaxy and so forth, and some <laughs> other people will be useful. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, so I kind of had a clarification. So you said that essentially like when there's an infant, like a newborn, they don't really they haven't done or are capable of doing anything to actually deserve a parent's love at that point. And you said like a parent's love is more for the like value of what they could achieve, like what, of human potential, right? Is it fair to say that you can, a parent can also love their child for the reason that, like for the same reason that they would love an accomplishment that took nine months to achieve also? Yeah, but it's gotta be good, right? Like if, if you had a fibroid that grew over nine months and then it was removed, right? You wouldn't be like, man, so much of my metabolic energy went into this fibroid. I, I love it. it it's uh, it's got to be something that you think is a, that's valuable. Into, this is a new human being, and it's one that I've already invested in. But then I've already invested nine months, and I've done all this. I've, I've you know, carried it. I gone through labor with it or whatever. But then why were you doing that for those nine months? Um, you're, you're already into the process with the thing because of you, you love this potential and then you've already, you don't just invest in it from the moment of birth, but from when you decide to have it. I mean, we, for example, this is small in the grand scheme of things, but spent a lot of money trying to have a kid, right? Indicating that we valued it prior to that. And, you know, I mean, I don't look at him and think of his price tag that often, but it's, you know. 
Um, it's something I'm aware of, like this is something we really wanted and worked towards. And I would think that um, you know, for a woman who's carried it in herself, um, that's a very intimate kind of work. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna jump in. We have a question from online. Uh, the question is, Elon Musk talks about the risk of population collapse. This seems to happen even in freer countries like Japan. Why do you think that as societies become more affluent, uh, people have fewer children, and do you think low birth rates are a risk to sustaining a population, as uh, Musk alludes to? I've thought only a little bit about this issue. I think... Um, As people get richer, they become aware of more opportunities to craft and shape their lives, more type of lives that they might have that aren't the same as their parents had, that aren't the same as just doing the default, whatever was the default in their society. And in societies that are newly affluent, um, the default is often you know, no birth control, having a kid every time um, you get pregnant and not doing that much to prevent it. Um, and also there are religious beliefs that often, um, often amount for that. And there aren't many ambitions that people have that seem realistic for them in those societies that would be frustrated by being in that role of having many children. Um, if the life that you envision for yourself is one of working on a farm, um, maybe the children are helpful and the, you know, as farmhands or whatever, but it's, um, it's different than if you think they have all these possible lives uh, set out for me and what, are, what, what can I do to achieve each one of them and ha how does having children fit into each of that. Um, so I think, yeah, it's, it's, that's a plausible explanation for why um, tr you know, birth rate falls as, to a point as countries get more wealthy. Um, I don't think we know how many people we need or how many is the ideal amount to have or at what pace different places get wealthy. And so I, I don't have a particular worry about this. I don't think there's a faded kind of uh, every place will get rich enough and then people will have too few children. Notice the same people who are worried about this, sometimes literally the same people like Musk, are also worried that AI will become super smart and start doing a whole lot of work and what will people do with themselves and maybe those things will go together. There'll be fewer people but using more AI. Um, I don't think anyone knows how to centrally plan or control this or even what the rates should be. So I don't think there's much use fretting about it. And um, I think people will kind of, I don't think anything will happen all at once. And if, if it feels like generations are getting smaller and smaller, I think enough people will be concerned about it. More of them will become pro having kids as a response to that. And, um, and kind of mores will evolve around it. And I, I just, I don't anticipate a huge problem here but I've not thought very deeply about it. Um, so a couple of friends in college were giving me this argument that every child should be entitled to a guardian or a therapist who prioritizes their psychological health. And I don't agree with that, but in the example of like a parent who is treating her child in a way that you know gives them debilitating depression or something in a way that they cannot pursue their life or pursuit of happiness, um, is there no like limit to where emotional abuse ever um, you know, becomes um, an infringement on the child's rights? Like is there? I don't know. There would have to be some. And there's not, you know, the, things fade from emotional to physical abuse if you're uh, we have to talk about specific cases. I don't know where that line would be. Mm -hmm. I think it would have to be drawn as precisely and carefully as possible and in such a way as to allow a great deal of bad treatment of children yeah. but criminalize only um, the most demonstrably negatively affecting that people from a wide variety of views of, um, uh, of, uh, of you know, what's best for people can can all easily see, yeah, that's really going to damage the child. Otherwise, you um, you cut off the space for um, better than par ways of raising children. And 
Um, I would just look to family law and what, what doctrines there are now and think about uh, which ones are better or worse and how to develop it. Um, that's not saying much. I mean, people have researched this, but I'm not one of them. But I just wanted to kind of put that in as a kind of point that the, someone asked earlier, what are the things that come into sharp relief when one thinks about uh, uh, child raising and parenthood as a central part of life? One of them is that it makes law very complicated, particularly law as it relates to um, rights of children versus parents. So you think that to an extent a child should have um, certain like protection for their psychology? I think they should have protection against anything that might be a kind of torture or abuse. Okay. But what it means to say that it's psychological torture or abuse, like it's a very slippery slope, so I'd want, you know, if you're treating them, you know, if you're locking them in a room and blasting music at them so they can't function like you would do to a, to a victim of literal torture, obviously that's yeah. abuse. And likewise, if it's a tape that quietly says, you know, you're no good, or whatever. But where the line is between a, a hectoring um, uh, parent who, who um, is doing a real number on the kids and real abuse, um, abuse that should be legally abuse, not just we'd say it's an abusive relationship, that I don't know. Okay, thank you. Relevant to that last point, my own view is that par the children have all the rights of adults, except that because of their nature, they can't exercise them properly, and that the role of parents is as trustees for their rights, and that they must act or should act in, uh, in order to, as uh, fiduciaries for the welfare of the child. Now, uh, the standard of legal abuse should be, in my view, and I'd like to have your opinion, that the parents can do anything except uh, anything that has a permanent effect on the child that the child can't undo when they are of legal age or emancipated. Um, so I agree with the idea about fiduciaries. Um, but I don't know how much that, um, that clarifies something like how should a parent think if they're being responsible and how should a court judge when, what's the question to ask? Are they acting in what they believe to be the child's interests and so forth? But then, given that there are such wildly different views about what is to someone's interest, what's the good, I'll make a man out of him or whatever, um, and um, uh, I'm thinking in particular of the, the scene in um, 12 Angry Men, if people know about that, um, uh, which is clearly an abusive father, but um, the, uh, it's not clear how well that helps you settle questions of is this abuse or, or is this not, uh, because you could always say, well, I'm, I think it's in his interest to be more disciplined, and this is how I think you promote discipline or whatever. Yeah. Uh, as to the permanent uh, harm standard, um, or permanent, well, what's a harm and what's an improvement is one of these things people disagree with. And a lot of things are, like, are, are permanent. So if you, some people pierce little children's ears. Um, is that child abuse? And they should be taken out of it. It's a permanent change. I mean, you, the piercing could heal up, but there'll always be the hole. What about you give someone a, a smallpox vaccination, and it's got the, you know, they always have the little thing that you could see, you think it's, it's clearly worth it, but suppose I'm wrong, and uh, even in the context where I think smallpox, you know, you're in a place where there's smallpox, those vaccinations are good, they're not that. That was a permanent change. That my, so I don't think the, the permanent change can quite be the standard. It has to, because uh, so many things, leave permanent marks when you're a kid, including permanent physical marks. Um, you, they have an operation, and they need the operation for medical reasons, but there's a scar. For their life. So I think it also has to be, um, is it plausible that they have a rational basis for thinking that this helps, you know, is benefiting the child? I have another one from online. Okay. Uh, you mentioned early in your talk uh, borderline cases of rights. Mm -hmm. um, could you comment on that further? I think the one I mentioned is conjoined twins, because I said that if you're not a 
physically distinct uh, person, you can't, a physiologically distinct uh, person separate from other human beings in your body, you can't have, uh, you can't have rights, but what about conjoined twins? These are two people who are, you know, they, they share parts of a body. Well, I think if you just think about the case with them, they certainly can't have rights with respect to the other, right? I mean, like, what happens if suppose you two were conjoined and one of you hit the other? Do I imprison just that half of you? Or you, know, you couldn't, there's nothing you can do to the one that you can't do to the other, at least nothing that I can figure out. There's going to be moral principles uh, for how they should try to deal with each other in this particularly uh, tragic case, and there are conjoined twins who have found ways to get jobs, and one of the controls one part of the body and the other the other, and they're, they're able to do things, and it's, you know, interesting and admirable. But whatever principles they have for resolving conflicts they might have among one another, those principles can't be right. So they're not able to go their own way if they disagree. And if one of them tries to go the way of the other when they try to go their own way, there's no way to punish the one without punishing the other. So it's just not the kind of things rights can be involved in. Now, the twins together or uh, could have rights with respect to some other person. That is, if someone else comes up and hits the twins or one or the other of them, they could be sued or whatever, and you can make a contract. But um, there can't be rights you know, adjudicating disputes between them precisely because, again, they can't separate and they can't be punished separately, at least in most of the ways we know to, 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 to punish or constrain people. Uh, and, you know, what to do in a case if there's ever been one where, you know, somehow one conjoined twin knocks out the other and commits a murder or whatever and how do you arrest them? I don't know. That's a good, you know, plot for a book, I suppose. <laughs> but it's a, it's, it's a hard case precisely because there's no way to deal with it through normal rights of one against the other. And if we were a species that regularly resulted, we were regularly conjoined with one another in this way, we'd be a different kind of species with a necessarily a different kind of lifestyle, life that we lived in a different kind of politics. Um, we deal with them the ways that we do, and they have to deal with life the way that they do in the context of this being an unusual thing that happens in the context of a species that generally lives otherwise and has ways of, of dealing with that. Thank you for this amazing talk, Dr. Salmieri. I wanted to address the gender conversion therapy issue. Mm -hmm. We have laws against adults making contractual arrangements with children directly mm -hmm. because children are incapable mm -hmm. of negotiating on their own behalf. Mm -hmm. So how can you advocate that parents can unilaterally decide to change their child's gender when the child is prepubescent? They haven't passed through puberty. So who's the one that's unilaterally deciding? If you're talking about a parent doing it against the child's expressed wishes, or are you talking about the child wants it, but we think he's unable to make these decisions, so the parent's deciding it? I mean, that's the case we're talking about. Because if you have like a 16-year-old a who says... The, no, not a 16. Really you're talking it's about an 8-year-old or a 10-year-old or a 9-year-old. Or a 5-year-old. Right. I mean, these cases that are being talked about where the child hasn't gone through even being 10. I mean, being an age where they're starting to be aware of themselves and their bodies. We're talking about these cases where they're going to insist they have to be put through these therapies or it won't take. But should a court be involved in approving it and having objective scientific evidence that this child is obviously one of those one in a billion who really has an issue chemical imbalance that has to be addressed. I think it's plausible for a court to be involved in the parents and making with the parents and the doctors in making decisions in some of these cases. What I'm worried about is a case where parents making decisions with doctors in a case where there isn't an in local parentis kind of court to deal with this are um, treated as cases of child abuse in a situation where what's good for the children is not well understood. And the state legislature or more particularly the um, 
the uh, executive is proposing to have the answer to do, the answer for what's medically or psychologically best for these children in a situation where I don't think anyone, I don't think I know what's medically best, I don't know who does know what's medically best, but I don't think it's the kind of thing that should be decided by voting. If it were being decided by the court system, in particular in a situation of they're trying to adjudicate who's looking out for the child's best interest and who's making decisions in which they reasonably believe to be the child's best interest and are they following plausible standards of evidence and science, um, that's the kind of thing I think family courts could probably do, but I'm worried about it being politicked. And I think it does get politicked by both political parties and you hear about only the most outrageous kinds of cases and on either side and you don't know who's doing what and it's not a kind of thing that should be decided uh, through political processes. Okay, thank you. Hi, Greg. Um, can you tell us what you've learned about the value of motor vehicle concepts from your son? <laughs> Not the value of them, but just like, you know, what is the hierarchy? The, the kind is... I mean, I'm more interested in some other of the epistemological questions that came up. That one was because he, he likes trucks so much. But there is definitely a joy and a value in um, going deep once one has a first level concept and noting all the different types of it. That's one thing I've noticed. Another thing that was really interesting is how clear he was working and how important to thought it must be to maintain the hierarchy as he was forming concepts. So he got the concept truck pretty early. And um, as we were driving a Chevy Silverado past us, and I said, that truck is a Silverado. And he said, bye bye Rado truck, as it drove away. And for quite a long time, whenever any he, was, he knew something was a truck. If you told him what else it was, he would affix truck to it. Um, that's a, like ice cream truck, but, but even if the word truck wasn't affixed, you know, that's a Ford truck, that's a Silverado truck. Why did truck have to be there? Because I think it was really important to him to maintain, this is not something I'm being told it is instead of a truck. It's a truck first, and then it gets sorted. And just the fact that, now that's something I already knew that there's a hierarchy to concepts and that it does that, but, but how important that was, how adamant he was about it, how he was perceiving that, how he was grasping that need to maintain that hierarchy so early was something that surprised me. Um, another epistemological thing that surprised me is, um, how early and how natural rationalism is. So I've not been one of these objectivists. Uh, it, it's not my, I don't think of rationalism as something to, to wag your finger at and oh my God, you're a rationalist, that's a kind of sin or whatever. I think of it as kind of what happens when we're using abstractions that we're not yet equipped to. And if you are at home with and comfortable with and that's a kind of your egocentric ways of using abstractions, you're a kind of rationalist and it's a problem and you're gonna, you know, you're not going to get better. But if you fall into it sometimes when you're at, on the periphery of your knowledge, that's just normal and part of the way of doing things. But can you have rationalism with first and second level concepts? You might think you couldn't, but it turns out you can. So you, it's pretty obvious perceptually how you sit on a chair. Like what, the, what direction you would have to be on to sit on the chair. Maybe you have difficulty doing it or finding it, but you, nobody would think just by looking at it that you, know, you could do this right, and, and, and wind up seated. But little kids get the concept chair, and they try that. And they wouldn't have tried it before you told them it was a chair, and you could sit in it, and you see. But you get the idea that there's a chair, and you could sit in chairs, and, and there's no like, well, let's hold the context here. You've got to sit in it when it's this way. You know, and not that. And there are lots of little things like that where when the concept comes, the knowledge of the concept is applied even to first level perceptual objects in ways that are surprisingly clumsy and unartful and then quickly they learn and they're able to, they're able to do it. But there's a kind of um, 
work to holding and conceptual holding and applying concepts even at the early level that you can kind of um, not quite be up to and have the concept and I found that really fascinating um, there are a few other things a few other things like this in terms of how value concepts get formed and so forth but I'll leave that for another time a uh, last question um, you've stated that the existence of a next generation is valuable to present generations but do you think it should affect an individual's choice to reproduce? If it should, then in what way and by which mechanism? And if it shouldn't, then do you think most people would choose to reproduce in a rationally selfish world? Because today, it seems that many simply default to having children because, well, that's what everybody does, and they don't give much consideration to the costs. And I don't think that's very rational. Um, I think the general value of there being a next generation the need for it, is part of the context in which an individual forms the value of having kids or doesn't. But like there are lots of sort of background facts about what people need that are part of the context necessary to form certain values. So people need buildings. Not everybody's got to be an architect or in the building trades, but if it wasn't the case that we had a need for habitation, then being a Howard Rourke would be out, right? That isn't a way you could... Uh, there doesn't need to be like, you know, a petty larceny. So living as a petty larcen is out, right? There has to be some kind of background need uh, for, the value, for values to be able to arise. And I think the need for a next generation is part of what subserves and makes possible the various ways in which having children can be the kind of spiritual value that it is. Um, at least that's my view of it. And then why would it be a value to particular parents? Well for the kind of reasons I indicated, but not to everyone. And a lot of people have kids, um, or people sometimes have kids because they feel obligated to, and maybe when they shouldn't have them. I think the better of those people uh, come to love the children for the reasons that most good people come to love their children. And um, then the story of their lives goes forward, you know, with them having real values that they love, but maybe uh, with some mistakes baked into them, which is how, you know, at some level of abstraction, almost everybody's life goes. Thank you.